Dear students, how are you? Hope you are well by the grace of Almighty. Welcome to my lecture number 5. Today I am going to talk about some important topics from the great epic Beowulf. First of all, I would like to inform some important traits of the characters of Beol. So let's get started. First of all, the character Beol exemplifies the traits of the perfect hero. The poem explores his heroism in two separate phases, youth and age, and through three separate and increasingly difficult conflicts with Grendel, Grendel's mother and the dragon. Although we can view these three encounters as expressions of the heroic code, there is perhaps a clearer division between Beowulf's youthful heroism as an unfettered warrior and his mature heroism as a reliable king. These two phases of his life, separated by 50 years, correspond to two different models of virtue. And much of the moral reflection in the story centers on differentiating these two models and on showing how Beowulf makes the transition from one to the other. In his youth, Beowulf is a great warrior, characterized predominantly by his feats of strength and courage, including his fabled swimming match against Bracer. He also perfectly embodies the manners, values dictated by the Germanic heroic code, including loyalty, courtesy, and pride. His defeat of Grendel and Grendel's mother validates his reputation for bravery and establishes him fully as a hero. In his first part of the poem, in the first part of the poem, Beowulf matures little as he possesses heroic qualities in abundance from the start. Having first Denmark of his place and established himself as a hero, however, he is ready to enter into a new phase of life. Rodger, who becomes a mentor and father figure to the younger warrior, begins to deliver advice about how to act as a wise ruler. Though Beowulf does not become King for many years, his exemplary career as a warrior has served in part to prepare him for his ascension to the throne. The second part of the story, set in Gitland, skips over the middle of the Beowulf's career and focuses on the very end of the, his life. Through a series of retrospectives, however, we recover much of what happened during this cave and therefore are able to see how Beowulf comports himself as both a warrior and a king. The period following Hygelac's death is an important transitional moment for Beowulf in the state of rushing for the throne himself, as Rodger does in Denmark. In the final episode, the writer epitomizes the and the encounter with the dragon. The poet reflects further on how the responsibilities of a king who must act for the good of the people and not just for his own glory differ from those of the heroic warrior. In light of these meditations, Beelzebub's moral status becomes somewhat ambiguous at the poem's end. Though he is deservedly celebrated as a great hero and leader, his last courageous fight is also somewhat rash. The poem suggests that, by sacrificing himself, the old unnecessarily leaves his people without a king, exposing them to danger from other tribes. To understand Beowulf's death strictly as a personal failure, however, is to neglect the overwhelming emphasis given faith in this last portion of the poem. The conflict with the dragon has an aura of inevitability about it, rather than a conscious choice. Additionally, it is hard to blame him for according to the dictates of the warrior culture. The second character indicates 
the green deal himself <coughs> actually the poem's most memorable creation green deal is one of the three monsters that bears back his nature is ambiguous though he has many animal attributes and grotesque monsters appearing he seems to be guided by vaguely human emotions and impulses and he shows more of an interior life than one might expect he is thus descended from a figure who epitomizes resentment and malice while the poet somewhat sympathetically suggests that Kendall's deep bitterness about being excluded from the right rivalry in the mid hall owes in part to his accursed status Rodger is another important character that is portrayed in the poem in different traits. Rodger the East ruler of the Danes who accepts Beowulf's help in the first part of the story aids in Beowulf's development into maturity. Rodger is a relatively static character, force of stability in the social realm. Although he is then solidly rooted in the theory code as Beowulf is, his old age and his experience with both good and ill fortune have caused him to develop a more reflective attitude towards heroic than Beowulf possesses. He is aware of both the privileges and the dangers of power, and he wants his young protege not to give him give in to pride. Always to remember that blessings may turn to die. Rodker's meditations on heroism and leadership, which take into account a hero's entire lifespan rather than just his valiant youth, reveal the contrast between youth and old age that forms the turning point in Beelzebub's own development. Unfurl is another important character that challenges to Beowulf's honor differentiates him from Beowulf and helps to reveal some of the subtleties of the heroic code that warriors must follow. Anfart is presented as a laser man, a foil for the near perfect Beowulf. Thus, the bitterness of Anfart's siding of Beowulf about his swimming match with Barbarossa clearly reflects his jealousy of the attention that Beowulf receives. It probably also stems from his shame at being unable to protect Europe himself. Wiglaf, one of Beowulf's kinsmen and thanes, is the only warrior brave enough to help the hero in his fight against the dragon. Wiglaf conforms perfectly to the hero code in that he is willing to die attempting to defeat the opponent and more importantly to save his lord. In this regard, Wiglaf appears as a reflection of the young Beowulf in the first part of the story, a warrior who is strong, fearless, valiant, and loyal. He embodies Beowulf's statement from the early scene in the poem that he, it is always better to act than to cry. Wiglaf thus represents the next generation of heroism and the future of the kingdom. His bravery and solid bearing provide the single point of Optimism in the final part of the story, which for the most part is dominated by a tone of despair at what the future holds. Grendel's mother is another important character in Beowulf. She acts like her son, is a mysterious human creature. She enters the poem as an adventure, seeking retreat for the faith of her son at Beowulf's. Hand. For this reason, some readers have seen Grindel's mother as an embodiment of ancient random European society's tendency toward unending bash foods. The dragon plays an important role and it, and it is a mighty and glamorous opponent an appropriate match for Beowulf. The dragon is so well suited to bring about Beowulf's downfall. In fact, the psalm readers have seen it as a symbolic representation of David's psalm. The unique personal aim that 
avoids every person that can prepare us to give the dragon in this way when he wants to be of that. For every warrior, an unbeatable foe lies in wait, even if it is only old age. However, the dragon also symbolizes the specific fate that lies in wait for the gates and for pagan society generally. The dragon, like behold, the dragon uses its strength to through a huge amount of treasure, but in the end, all the treasure does is bring about its state. The treasure also brings about Belshazzar's state. Possibly the poem says Christian narrator says Greek for treasure as a kind of spiritual day suffered by pagans who value treasure over heaven. The dragon hovers his treasure in a pharaoh that is a grief. Now we move to the, the new chapter, the introduction of Dark Ages in the Middle English period, as well as in English literature. Why was 900 years of European history labeled with the Dark Ages? We can find an answer by following this lecture. First of all, the term the Dark Ages refers to the period between the fall of the Roman Empire and Renaissance, the 5th to 14th century. It has been suggested that this period saw little scientific and cultural advancement. However, the term doesn't stand up to much scrutiny, and many medieval historians have dismissed it. The coining of Dark Ages. The first person to coin the term Dark Ages was built to be Francisco Petrarch, popularly known as Petrarch, an Italian scholar of the 14th century. He bestowed his label upon the period in which he lived as he was dismayed at the lack of good literature at the time. The classical era was rich with apparent cultural advancement, but Roman and Greek civilizations had provided the world with contributions to science, philosophy, architecture, and political systems. Granted, there were aspects of Roman Greek society culture that were very unsavory, but after Rome's fall and subsequent withdrawal from power, European history is portrayed as taking a, a wrong turn. After Petrarch's disagreement to the dark age of literature, other thinkers of the time expanded this term to encompass this perceived dearth of culture in general across Europe between 500 to 14. These dates are under constant scrutiny by history that there is a degree of overlapping dates. Later on, as more evidence came to light after the 18th century, scholars started to restrict the term dark ages the period between 1500 to 10th centuries. This period came to be referred uh, to as the early Middle English, Middle Ages. First thing the Dark Ages meet. Labeling this large period of history as a time of little cultural advancement, its people as unsophisticated, however, a sweeping generalizations and regularly considered to be incorrect and did many argue that the dark ages never truly happened in a time epitomized by extensive increases in Christian missionary activity. It appears early Middle East kingdoms lived in a very interconnected world. The early English church, for instance, relied heavily on priests and bishops who had trained abroad. In the late 7th century, the Archbishop Theodore founded a school at Canterbury that would go on to become a key center of scholarly learning in Anglo Saxon England. Therefore, himself, Theodore himself had originated from Tarsus in southeastern Asia Minor. People are not just traveling to Anglo Saxon England, however, Anglo Saxon men and women were also regular sites in mainland Europe. Nobles and commoners went on frequent and often perilous pilgrimage to Rome and even further away. If you look at the class wars that I provided in lecture uh, week's task, 
then you can easily find how did the dark is coming what are the trays that we can find out in the dark ages so let's find out the traits or characteristics of the dark ages by following the lectures and you are all, always asked to create an information or create a question to ask me in the forum section thank you very much